Well, here we are in Sardis, which is one of the highlights. We've got the Temple of Artemis here, that's Diana. We've got the little church that was built later, which replaced that, and worship of the true God took place here. And then way up on the horizon, we've got the Acropolis. And in fact, uh, in the letter to Sardis, we're going to see a number of these things referred to. So let's open the letter and read it. To the angel of the church in Sardis. And the letter runs like this. This is a message from him who holds in his hand the sevenfold Spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all about you. You've built up a reputation for being alive, church, but in fact you are dead. Now wake up. Put your energy into what little you still have before it dies. Nothing you have started has been finished in the sight of God. Call to mind how much you've been given and all that you've been taught and hang on to these and turn around. If you won't wake up to what's happening to you, I'll come to you like a burglar to rob you even of what you still have, and it will be when you least expect me. Yet I have a list of a few names, people in Sardis, who have kept themselves clean, and they will one day walk around with me wearing white robes, for they have deserved them. Anyone who has kept themselves clean like this will wear such garments, and I will never, ever rub his name out from my record in the Book of Life. Indeed, I will be proud to call his name out in front of my Father and all his angels. Let everyone who hears these letters read take heed of what my Spirit is communicating to all seven churches. Here is Sardis now, and Sardis is a dead city. There's nobody living there, just a few scattered cottages. And the result is you've got all the magnificent town of Sardis as it was. Ruined, yes, but you can see what an amazing place it was. Way down below you've got this huge temple of Diana, and next to it a little church that has taken over later. So the pagan temple of Diana was in ruins and they built this little church next door. Unusual church with two naves, one after the other, because in one of them is buried an early martyr, a Christian martyr. And then way up on the top of the hill is the Acropolis, or as I've told you, the Summit City. And that is built on this uh, towering peak above the city below, and it's surrounded by these vertical cliffs. There is only one way up to it, and that's a little narrow path. They called this summit city of Sardis the impregnable. Nobody could take it, and yet twice in history it was taken by enemy troops, and we shall see just how and why in a moment. Thirty miles southeast of Thyatira in the Hermas Valley, this was the end of the royal road that was built by the kings of Persia when they marched west. And they built a royal road which you can still travel along, and the terminus of that road was here in Sardis. In 560 BC it was the capital of King Croesus, and this is where coins were invented. Wealth. It just speaks of it. In fact, there's a little river running down the main street of Sardis and there is gold dust in the river. It's the city of gold and you can pan for it if you've got enough patience. An affluent society, always been a wealthy city, and therefore we may say three things about the city which I'm afraid were coming through into the church as well when Jesus wrote this letter. First thing is, Wealth makes you self-sufficient. Now this city, like other cities in this earthquake area, because the crust of the earth is very thin in this part, uh, this city had suffered from the earthquake in AD 17, which had demolished other cities, and with the other cities the Roman emperor remitted their taxes for a whole year and said you can use the tax to rebuild a city. 
They didn't want that. They were self-sufficient. We're going to find Laodicea was the same. And so Sardis was self-sufficient. You don't need to help us. We are rich enough not to need help. Secondly, Sardis was self-confident. And particularly because of this Acropolis. If enemies came, they just all went up the hill by that single path and they were safe. If you've been to Masada in Israel, it was very similar to that. One path up and a sheer cliff all round. And they just simply went up there and laughed at the armies besieging them below. But in 549 BC and in 218 BC, it was taken first by the Persians and then by the Greeks and for the same reason. It happened twice. It's almost too much to believe the coincidence, but each time a soldier on guard above the single path dropped his helmet or on the other occasion some part of his armour and went down to pick it up. And the army below carefully noted where he came down and the path which you can't see from below, they carefully mapped it out and then went up. And because they were so impregnable up there, the sentries were invariably off duty and were not watching. They felt too self-confident. It's very interesting this because uh, I heard of an, uh, a soldier in the British Army who was on sentry duty and he was in his box at the gate of the camp and he fell asleep and he was leaning like this, his eyes shut and then he sort of opened his eyes and the commanding officer was standing in front of him. So with great presence of mind, he closed his eyes again and said, Amen. <laughs> and the commanding officer said, Good man, carry on. But here were sentries, here were sentries who thought nobody could ever take them and so they didn't watch and slept. And you get this coming out in the letter, wake up, watch, I'm coming like a thief to rob you, says Jesus. And that would really mean something to these people. But there is a third thing that wealth does, it makes you self-indulgent. Spend it all on yourself. So we have these three characteristics of what happens to people who've got money. And listen, by New Testament standards, everybody in this room is rich. If you've got more than five pounds a day, then you're rich. That would be the equivalent of the daily wage in Jesus' day for a working labourer. When you're rich, these things happen to you. That's why it's hard to enter the kingdom. But then rich is relative. We used to think that one of our neighbours in Guildford was rich. His name was Paul Getty. And we thought, now he's rich. You always think somebody who's got more than you have is, are the rich. But in fact, by biblical standards, we are rich. Self-sufficient, self-confident and self-indulgent. Sardis became a byword for flabby luxury living, for soft people. They had superb baths, they had a superb stadium, theatre, sports field, they had everything. All built down here on the plain below the Acropolis on the summit. Somebody has called it a city of amateur dance band leaders and shopkeepers. Herodotus, the Roman historian, actually said it was a byword for lax moral standards and open licentiousness. So the real danger here was not from external enemies, though they fell twice to the Persians and the Greeks. The real danger was corruption from within. And every society is more in danger from that than from external attack and pressure. I mentioned that 21 civilizations have come and gone. Do you know they all fell not by military attack from others, but by moral decay from within. Read Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. You'll get the picture. You go to Middle America, Central America, and look at the Aztecs and their architecture and, and the things they were able to achieve, and yet they are all now gone. And you find again it was moral decay from within that spells the end of a civilization, which is why the British Empire has collapsed and we are in a decaying, declining civilization. That's why there's no city of Sardis now. And so there are lots of ruins to look at. Well, now what about the church here? Unfortunately, the church reflects the society. 
One of the things we went to see along here to the left was the synagogue. Now, wherever trade and money were in the ancient world, the Jews were. And they've kept that up ever since. They're very good businessmen. It was an elderly Jew in Jerusalem who told me about a Jewish man who bought a little shop in New York, just a little shop, squeezed between two huge department stores. And he wondered what to call his little shop, so he called it Entrance. <laughs> and uh, this is a typical Jewish joke. <laughs> See? And so when that is why in all these cities in Asia there was a Jewish population. And when we went into the synagogue there, it was staggering. It surely was the wealthiest synagogue that we were in. A beautiful, huge mosaic floor, statues of lions, do you remember it? A beautiful apse with tiered seats. The, the whole thing was not just a simple synagogue, it, it was lavish, which tells me that the church was probably in a similar condition. One of the most striking things is that in Sardis, neither Jew nor Gentile bothered about the church. And that tells me the church was too much like them. It was a live church, had a full program of activities. Everybody said, now if you want to see a live church, you go to Sardis. And clearly it was a very popular church. And therefore, a church that somehow had become too like the society around it. Successful, full, but a spiritual club. Very much like synagogue or the temples or whatever. It was an acceptable, respectable place. I just wrote down it was an organization rather than an organism, a business rather than a body, activities rather than achievement, and ritual rather than reality. It's a pretty tough list that I know, but it seemed to be on the outside a very active, humming church with life. And Jesus said, it's dead. And one of the most damning things Jesus was going to say was, nothing you start gets finished, which tells me they were always starting something new, always getting visions, always getting new programs, always saying, let's do this, let's do that. But somehow, nothing got finished in the sight of God. And it's very much easier to start something than finish it, believe me, very much easier. And it's jolly hard to stop things once you've started them <laughs> as well, even if they don't get finished in God's sight. Well, now let's look at the letter. What does the writer say about himself here? Now, there's a bit of controversy about this one. As you can see in the uh, chart you've got in front of you, he says, talks about having the seven spirits and the seven stars. Now, the seven stars, we know what they are. They are the guardian angels of the seven churches. That's explained in chapter 1. But what about these seven spirits of God? What are they? Now, I'm afraid most preachers, most commentators will tell you that's the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it's a very funny way to talk about the Holy Spirit, isn't it? To talk about him as seven spirits, plural. But usually that's uh, attributed to a kind of literary device that it refers to the sevenfold spirit, that it's one spirit in seven aspects. And certainly in Isaiah you've got uh, a sevenfold spirit which is resting on the Messiah, the spirit of wisdom and understanding of counsel and so on. The sevenfold spirit. But that doesn't convince me. Why not just say the sevenfold spirit, if that could be said in Greek? I don't know. But why say spirits? Well, I can only say that uh, if you look up your Bible later in the in this very book, you find an explanation. So often, you know, one scripture explains another. And I want to read just one verse. It's chapter 5, verse 6. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, it seems to me that is not the Holy Spirit, but seven angels who are observers. 
on behalf of heaven and to go around the world and report back to God what they see. Do you follow me? And they are said to connect up with the lamb that has been slain. Now, I think we need look no further. Here we have in one hand of the writer the seven guardian angels who look after the churches, and in the other hand seven angels whom he uses as observers in the world to report back to him what they find. See, we haven't half an understanding of how much the angels are doing. Jesus actually once called himself Jacob's ladder. He said, I'm Jacob's ladder. You're wondering where he said that, aren't you? You read his conversation with Nathaniel. He said to the Nathaniel, what will you think if you see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man? He's saying, I'm the link between earth and heaven. I'm the ladder and I use angels. And there are messengers of God going to and fro on the earth. When the first Russian astronaut came back from space, um, he made a joke. It's a kind of joke against the few Christians still in Russia. He said, I didn't see any angels up there. And they all roared with laughter. But the angels saw him. <laughs> you know, the world is so lonely. We think we're the only intelligent life in the whole universe. We're desperately trying to find life out there. E.T. onwards. Usually we create frightening kinds of life, but E.T. was quite cosy, a sort of family pet. But we're, we're trying to find there's somebody else out there. But in fact, there are thousands upon thousands out there. The angels fill the universe. Sometimes we can see them, sometimes we can't. An American astronaut was a bit more honest when he was asked, did you meet God out there? He said, no. But he said, if I'd taken my spacesuit off, I would have done it. <laughs> Which was uh, <laughs> a little more honest. But here we have a picture of Jesus with angels looking after the churches and angels looking out over the world and reporting back. Yeah, that seems to me the simpler explanation, but I'm not going to be dogmatic. If you want to believe it's the sevenfold spirit, you're at liberty to do that. And one day we'll have all these questions answered. Won't it be marvellous to go and ask Paul what he really meant? And one day you'll have all your questions answered. You'll know even as you've been known. The problem is when people make their questions a barrier to faith and are not content to wait until they get an answer. Anyway, so here we have two-way messengers, guardian angels looking after the churches and observant angels going around the world and reporting back. The eyes of Jesus, uh, the seven eyes which are the seven spirits sent into the world. Now, approval, nothing, not one thing. And this is the church everybody's talking about. I suppose it's the supreme example of the contrast between human and divine opinion about a church. It can be almost the opposite. I'm afraid we judge by our eyes. That's one of the basic problems. We look at what we see and we judge what we see. The Lord does not do that. He looks at the heart. He doesn't look at your Sunday best clothes. He looks at what kind of a person is wearing them coming to church. And he sees something quite different. So there is not a single virtue mentioned. There must have been some good point, surely, in this church, but uh, Jesus can't see them. What he can see is death. I know your deeds. Up to now, there's been approval for every church. Let's uh, go back to the chart for a moment. And uh, there's been approval right up to there, and now nothing. It's going to be one more as well, and a very similar condition, but it's just nothing. The blank hits you. But now look at the accusation. It's a mixture of saying you're dead and you're asleep, but then Jesus often used those two terms for the same condition. The little girl that he raised, daughter of Jairus. She's not dead, she's sleeping. But uh, fallen asleep is a, a synonym for dying. It looks like falling asleep, and they, they're in a mixture of sleep, a coma that leads to death. Very vivid. They are professing without possessing life. They have the form of godliness, but not the power. They have the appearance, but not the reality. They are worshipping, but not in spirit and in truth. They are honouring God with their lips, but not with their hearts or lives. 
Years ago, my wife and I were invited to a garden party. It was either late September or early October to meet a very well-known preacher from America called Dr. Wilbur Smith. And a number of us were invited to meet him, listen to him. And we arrived at this garden. We came around the back of the house and the garden was a blaze of color. You've never seen anything like it. With daffodils, hyacinths, all sorts of colors. And we said, oh, can't remember a name now, thank goodness. Oh, Mrs. Sunset, what a guy. And then we stopped. We thought, no, this is September, October. And she'd bought up the entire stock of the local Woolworths of plastic flowers <laughs> and had stuck them in all the flower beds. And it was a picture. I said to my wife, come here, let's just stand and watch people's faces when they arrive. <laughs> and we took great joy watching people come in. <laughs> and then they would cry. You know what the British are like about plastic flowers. We're, we're getting over it now, but um, they would sidle along with sort of downcast faces. It was priceless. That's the kind of reaction Jesus must be having at Sardis. Everybody else saying, what a live church, what a busy church, what a marvelous church. And Jesus said, it's plastic, it's dead. They're not alive, they're dead. He came to the fig tree and found no fruit, and he cursed that tree. Appearances can be very deceptive. It was a spiritual graveyard. Now, he makes this very interesting point that nothing you start is finished, but the word finished is actually fulfilled. It means it doesn't come to anything. It doesn't come to maturity. It doesn't come to fruit. It, you start things with every intention of doing it for the Lord and, and producing fruit for Him, but actually it never actually produces what you hoped it would. It's just activity. It doesn't produce a harvest. Well, need I say more? There are an awful lot of things the church raises money for and plans for and publicizes, and somehow it's not fulfilled. A lot of our evangelistic out, outreaches are like this. I'm afraid I'm naughty when I talk to pastors and so on. If they've just had a big town-wide crusade, I say, now tell me honestly, did the results come up to your expectations and hopes, exceed them, or fall below them? And they look at each other and often say, well, it brought the Christians together. I say, was that your objective? Was that the fruit that you were looking for? No, it wasn't. We've got to be honest. The church can be very active and very alive, planning programs, pouring money and time and energy into things, and they are not fulfilled. They're not filled full. And maybe it looks good and it impresses as a live program, but in Christ's sight, it's not producing what I want. And he came to the fig tree because he was hungry looking for figs, and there was no fruit on it. And Jesus said, henceforth, no man will eat from you. And the next day they said, look, the tree's dead. He said, yes, and if you had faith that big, you could tell a mountain to jump in the sea and it would go. Very challenging stuff, isn't it? However, there was a little ray of hope. Jesus said, I've got a list here. I've got a few names. Do you know, I've found, have you found, the worst church God has not left himself without witness. There's somebody there, maybe even a few people just meeting for prayer. There's, there's some hope there, there's some little good. And it's lovely that Jesus keeps a list of church members' names. He's got a book of life, and it's a very important book to get your name in. And just getting your name on an earthly church membership roll doesn't get it into that book. And keeping it on an earthly roll doesn't keep it in that book. But Jesus keeps some names. Now just think, your name is on Jesus' list. Somewhere, by grace, John David Paulson is in there. That's the greatest privilege you can have. Some people get excited about spiritual power. They find they've got power to heal and cast out demons. Great. But Jesus' word to such people is, don't rejoice over your power. You just be happy because your names are in the book up there. That's the most 
important thing to have your name in his book. He said, I've got a few names inside us, just a few, and they're still in my book. And they haven't got worldly. They haven't soiled their garments. Now, uh, you heard on the video last night, actually, that they had a huge gymnasium and sports field. It's very impressive. Do you remember that big uh, brick and stone gymnasium? And uh, after they'd uh, had a bath and had their sports and washed clean, they then rejoiced to put on these white robes. They loved walking around in clean white robes. And Jesus picks all that up. And he says, those few names in Sardis who've not become like the world around them, they're going to walk with me in white. White is the color of heaven, of course. Uh, it's a mixture of all the colors. It's all the colors put together. There'll be other colors in heaven too, but white is the favorite color. And you'll find white keeps occurring all the way through Revelation. White stones, white robes, white, white. The great white throne at the end. White speaks of heaven more than blue. I'm afraid most people associate blue with heaven because it's sky, but white is the actual color of heaven. And I'm sure you know that pure gold is white. It's uh, impure gold that's yellow or green or orange, but pure gold, white. Now let's see what Jesus' advice to Sardis is. Wake up, very strong, wake up. Become alert. See what's going on around you. You're just, you're just asleep. Your eyes are closed. Wake up, open your eyes. And he says there to look to three things. First of all, look to the past. Once again, he's telling a church to remember what they used to be like. Memory, said someone, is the shortest road to repentance. You've got to remember what happened, what's gone wrong. What they've received, he said, remember what you received. Well, what was the best gift they received? The best gift they received was Jesus, and the next best gift they received was the Holy Spirit. Remember what you received. Those were the two greatest gifts that God gives to a believer, the gift of his Son and the gift of his Spirit. And remember what you heard. Go back to the original teaching that founded this church. Constantly, we need to go back to the original teaching of the church. That's why we need to keep going back to the New Testament. It's interesting and helpful to read church history, but you must keep going back to the apostolic doctrine enshrined in the New Testament if you're to keep right with God. So look to the past. Then he says, now look to the present. Do something about your condition. Obey what you heard. Hold fast the few things that are still left that are good because they're dying, which means that this busy, active church must go through its program very carefully and say, what are the few things that remain that will die if we don't do something about them? Now, there's an exercise for a busy, active church. Go through your whole program and say, now, what are those things that God wants us doing and why are so few people supporting them? Let's put our time and energy into those things rather than dissipate it in a busy program that never fulfills what God wanted it to. What a strong message this is. Second, third, look to the future. He says you're to keep watch. You're to keep awake. You're to be on sentry duty the whole time until I come. Now, this is a theme that keeps coming out in the Gospels. Jesus constantly says, watch and pray. Keep your eyes open. Keep watching. See the signs of my coming. And furthermore, he almost always links that in the Gospels with getting properly dressed, putting on the right clothes for Jesus' appearance. See that when he comes, you're not found naked but clothed. So this whole motivation of the second coming is very central to a healthy church. If you keep preaching, keep talking, keep reminding people that Jesus is coming back and we need to be ready for him when he comes, and my, we must be much sooner to Jesus' return now than they've ever been. And we are, of all churches, we ought to be the, the most ready of all the ages. We must be near. I'm coming soon, I'm coming quickly. Stay alert, watch. 
Jesus constantly talked of his second coming like a thief coming. But I want you to notice this. Paul makes it quite clear in 1 Thessalonians 5 that he will only come like a thief unexpectedly to two groups of people, unbelievers, obviously. To unbelievers, it will come as a complete shock when Jesus gets back. They just are not looking for him. They're not away. But, says Paul, he will also come as unexpectedly as a thief to sleepy believers, to the people who are living as if it's night. Whereas he said, you're children of the day, you're awake, you're alert, you will be watching for his coming. And therefore, he will not come unexpectedly and therefore will not come like a thief to you. A thief comes to take something away from you. And Jesus told parable after parable about a householder who, had he known the thief was coming, would have stayed awake and watched for him. So he will come like a thief in the night, but not to alert believers. We will know when he's on the way. When we see all the signs, we will know that he is at the door. So let's be quite clear. This, all this talk of coming like a thief in the night is only for unbelievers and sleepy believers who are no longer on sentry duty and are not watching. But to those who are of the day and who are awake, the Lord's coming will not be a surprise. Well, now that's his advice to Sardis. Look to the past, look to the present, look to the future. But look, wake up, get your eyes open, and look in these three directions. And so we come to this lovely promise, this assurance, to the faithful few and to any who repent and join them. It's not to the whole church. It's to the faithful few who have overcome and not soiled their garments with this worldly society and wealthy culture, but also to those who now, even now, will repent and join the minority group in the church. And the promise is threefold. There are three things promised. Number one I've already mentioned, pure raiment. They will walk with him in white. Notice, by the way, we won't be sitting in armchairs in heaven. We shall be walking. Jesus was a great walker, always walking. You followed him in the way. You had to walk hard if you followed Jesus. And Jesus was only giving us a picture of his Father God because God is presented all the way through Scripture as the God who walks. He was walking in the Garden of Eden right in the beginning. And because he's a God who walks, he never wanted David to build a temple for him. He said, a tent is good enough for me. And a tent can be put up and taken along because God walks. And therefore, a godly person is always described as someone who walks with God. If you don't keep walking, you'll soon lose touch with God because he's on the move. And Isaiah just slays the idols with ridicule by saying, look at them. They have eyes and they can't see. They have mouths and they can't speak. They have ears and they can't hear you. And they have feet and they can't walk. Boy, that text came to me forcibly when I stood in the temple of a thousand Buddhas in uh, Bangkok. They all looked as if they needed a good walk. <laughs> but they couldn't walk. They had feet, but they couldn't walk. Our God is a God who walks. And Enoch walked with God and went for such a long walk with him that God said, you're so far from home, you better come and spend the night with me. And that's how he got to heaven. What a wonderful way to go. Just walk right in. There's an old Negro spiritual song. I got shoes, you got shoes. All of God's children got shoes. When I get to heaven, I'm going to put on my shoes, going to walk all over God's heaven. And that was sung by cotton pickers who had no shoes. But they were living for the day when Jesus came back and gave them shoes and said, come with me for a walk. Even after his resurrection, one of the loveliest stories is what? The road to Emmaus. And it says here that Jesus walks among the lampstands. You need to be a good walker to be a Christian. Walking is not very exciting. It's not as exciting as jumping in the Spirit or dancing in the Spirit. But walking in the Spirit is just lifting up one foot and putting it there, and then lifting up this foot and putting it there. It means living life a step at a time, in the right direction, keeping going. And if you walk steadily, you can cover immense distances. <laughs> You'll walk with me in white. That's the first thing, pure raiment. The second thing is a permanent record. Now, here's one of the most startling things in the book of Revelation. 
And it's there in the other books in the Bible, and that is that your name can be rubbed out of the book of life. It's mentioned in Exodus, it's mentioned twice in Psalms, it's uh, mentioned in Malachi, it's mentioned in Philippians, it's mentioned in Revelation, this book of life. And in the majority of those references, it talks about names being rubbed out of the book of life. The literal verb is scraped off because the ink of those days on parchment, they couldn't rub it off, they scraped it off with a pen knife. And Jesus says, those who overcome, I will never ever, it's a double negative, never ever scrape his name off my book. And on the day of judgment, the most important thing for you is that your name is still in that book. Now, if he's saying this to <coughs> overcomers, what is he saying to undergoers, to those who don't make it? He's talking to Sardis. They've all been Christians. And he is saying, those who get right, I'll never ever scrape your name off been a permanent record forever and ever. And the third thing, public recognition. He said, I'll call out your name before my Father and all the angels. Now, wonderful. One day he says, Max! You see? And all the angels will know you. <laughs> He's one of mine. Boy, what a moment. Public recognition. Well, people will do anything for public recognition by people in the world. But the most important public recognition you could ever have is this. He will mention us by name before all the angels and Father. This is mine. He's mine. She's mine. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. The alternative is, I never knew you. That was said of bridesmaids waiting for the bridegroom, waiting for his coming. I didn't know you. Don't acknowledge you. Well, it means quite simply that those Christians in Sardis who did not overcome, would not walk with Jesus in white robes, would have their names scraped off the book of life, and would be denied before the Father and the angels. What a choice. The appeal is to the churches. Are we hearing it today? I think most people today think if once you get your name in that book, you're safe. Well, I don't think you are. Did Sardis pick themselves up? There are two positive indications. One is that on that site behind the very temple, which I was just showing you, behind the temple of Artemis, there is this little church. It's not too big, but it's there. Those few names stuck it, and they became a church and got a church building. That's about the fourth century, I think, that church. So it was still there. There's one other lovely indication. Later they had a pastor called Melit Melito in the second century, M-E-L-I-T-O, Melito. And uh, he was the first ever to write a commentary on the book of Revelation. So the very first biblical commentary on the book of Revelation we have was by Pastor Melito, Bishop Melito they called him, here in Sardis, which means that he taught his people this very book. And I'm quite sure when he got to the letter to Sardis, he laid it on with a trowel <laughs> and really said, now this is you and you've got to listen and you've got to wake up. And dear Pastor Melito kept them in this book of Revelation. I am urging every church in the, our country to take their people carefully through the book of Revelation. I believe it is urgently needed. I'll tell you why in the final talk. 